shelter. No. Stay up here with me, bud. Okay. <sighs> you know when you really like something and uh, people ask you to talk about it, but then you panic uh, because you feel like you're rambling or um, you're not doing the thing that you like justice because uh, it means so much to you and you don't want to, uh, you know, do it a disservice. Yeah, that's why this video is like two months late. <laughs> if you are not familiar with me, my name is Glitchwitch.jpg. I make videos about internet horror, analog horror, and digital horror, creepypastas, um, ARGs, internet urban legends, and then sometimes survival horror, which is usually just Silent Hill. But I really love the Mandela catalog. I don't know how to articulate my feelings about it because it's just like, to me it is representative of internet and analog horror on the whole. Do I think there are better internet horror series, like better quality, better storytelling, better visual, whatever? Yeah, I do. I've said that before on this channel, but it's one of those things where internet horror clicked to me when I saw the Mandela catalog. Like I had seen Local 58 and I had seen, you know, Gemini Home Entertainment and I had read creepypastas and stuff, but like analog horror finally clicked for me with the Mandela catalog and I watched it when it came out, but I've kind of spoken about this before. Um, if you've seen some of my other videos, the thing that sparked this era of my life is Skinner Marink came out, Kyle Edward Wald's wonderful film. And that just sparked an interest in this whole analog horror thing to me. And it made me go back and revisit the Mandela catalog. And, you know, this was like a big, an era of change for me. It was like January, 2023, um, which I got married in January of 2023. I ended up buying my first house a few months later. So it was like this thing that I could hold on to. <laughs> and bring me comfort in a very stressful time. Loved my wedding, loved getting married to my wonderful husband, but you know, planning a wedding is stressful. Uh, buying a house is stressful. Uh, so it was just this comfort to me. And then through there, I just got more and more into it. And then eventually I made this YouTube channel. Is I don't like, I don't want to use the word nostalgia because I don't think it's old enough to ever use that word, but it is always going to be emblematic of this entire community and, and space to me. Um, and that may not be the case for you, but that's okay. I'm talking about me. But um, because of that, I have been so nervous to make my first like true analysis video of the Mandela Catalog. I have made many videos where I mention the Mandela Catalog. I would say I have made more videos where I mention the Mandela Catalog than where I don't. In some capacity, in some fashion, I bring it up, I compare things to it. Um, I've made one full Mandela Catalog video. It's my evolution of the intruder video. It's a very early video, but it's still pretty fun. Um, and then I talked about it at length in my Music of Analog Horror video, covered it in like the tier lists, and a lot of characters were in my uh, Analog Horror Drag Race Simulator, and uh, I used the Intruder and Mandela Catalog in general uh, as an example in my uh, Cognito Hazard and Info Hazard video. So I talk about it all the time. I've made a joke saying like, if you do a drinking game where I mention the Mandela Catalog or Thorn Baker, You'll die. <laughs> you'll you'll die of alcohol poisoning. Um, so don't do that, please, <laughs> please. So needless to say, I have put this off. This video came out two months ago, the fifth installment of the Mandela catalog, and I was ready. I'm like, I'm gonna make that video that weekend that it came out. But then I watched it, and I was like, <sighs> and then things also just kept happening. You know, this summer has been a trove of just delectable internet horror delicacies. I discovered the McKinney family home videos, I discovered a Joaquin Bonk, um, you know, lots of different things that, you know, weren't as popular as the Mandela catalog and I felt the need to cover them because I wanted more eyes and more voices on that. Mandela catalog doesn't need a little me talking about it, you got Wendy talking about it and shit. So this is more just, uh, I want to make a video for the people like me who will watch literally anything there is to, to exist. <laughs> about this series. I will preface this, I have not watched any Volume 5 analysis. It's been very difficult because you know when Wendigoon dropped that hour 42 video, 
I wanted to just get my sink my greedy little paws into it, but I waited because I had to make this video. So thanks to a push from my lovely YouTube members, we are finally here. But um, I do want to say with full sincerity, there could be some rose colored glasses going in on this. Um, I love this series. <laughs> like I know that a lot of people are over it. Um, I know that a lot of people think it's a bad example of analog horror at this point. You are allowed your opinion. It means a lot to me. I love it dearly. Um, and I'm excited to talk about it. It's a, it, it's a heavy thing to have to talk about like your favorite thing ever. Like, you know, I love the Walton Files, but <laughs> the, the internal pressure, I don't, <laughs> I don't have a Walton Files tattoo. I have a Mandela Catholic tattoo. <laughs> So, you can get the imaginary weird pressure I'm putting myself through. But anyway, what are we going to do here today? Uh, we are going to discuss what happened in Volume 5 of the Mandela Catalog. I'm going to analyze it, and I'm going to tell you my thoughts. And I will say, despite my rose-colored glasses, I have criticisms, and I will tell them to you, okay? I will. But, um, bear with Glitchwitch here. Uh, my Lexapro ran out two days ago, and the pharmacy can't fill it until tomorrow, so it's great that I'm doing this unmedicated. I need some Timorol, don't I? <laughs> You'd get that if you've seen this video, which I hope. That's another thing. Please go watch the Mandela Catalog Volume 5 before this. I'm going to summarize it, but that's more as a refresher for anyone who watched it two months ago and, and doesn't really remember it. If you haven't seen it, Go see it. And frankly, if you haven't watched any of the Mandela Catalog, this is going to make no sense because I'm going full spoilers. I'm referencing older videos. This entry into this series is very, um, it builds upon the previous entries. Like it, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of loose ends are being tied together. There's a lot of circles becoming full circles. A lot of things make sense. A lot of things get explained in this one. Uh, if you're as psychotic as I am. Maybe to some people they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's why you have freaks like me to tell you what potentially could be going on. So, without further ado, let's get in to just a little bit of a summary. There's, there's been two concurrent timelines in the Mandela catalog thus far. We have a 90s timeline with characters like Mark Heathcliff and uh, a younger version of Lieutenant Thatcher Davis. And then we have a like 2000s timeline with teenage Adam and Sarah and um, an older Thatcher Davis and like Dave Lee and, and people like that. So this video is a 90s video. And I will say it, I prefer the 90s videos because I, d I don't love the teenage characters in the Mandela catalog. I just don't. I think that the fan base fixates on them a little bit too much. I want creatures. <laughs> Give me creatures. And I feel like there's more creatures in the 90s. And, you know, I buy Thatcher in 1993 a little more than I do in 2006. But we're not. I'm not. I want you to know, because I consistently criticize Thatcher Davis. It's because I love him. I am a Thatcher girly through and through. So it's one of those, like, I can bully him. You can't, okay? Be nice in the comments. <laughs> this uh, entry opens up with some credits, which I love. Very cinematic, very, mm, it made me excited. I love, give me an ounce of graphic design and I go, woo, because I'm a graphic designer. Um, but it opens up with the 911 call that Jude Murray, the father of Adam Murray, calls in in volume three. And he is talking to our protagonist, Lieutenant Thatcher Davis. In this call, this is the exact call from volume three. He's describing a male figure in his house that he doesn't recognize, he's never seen before. We know it is an alternate. Resemble 
this is the night where uh, Lynn Murray, his ex-wife, uh, took her own life because uh, the intruder, my favorite little Glorbo, who I have permanently etched in my skin, <laughs> kidnapped infant Adam Murray. And uh, the thing that we learn though this time is that Jude flees after making the call. He leaves the house. And then we can assume after Jude leaves, that is when Thatcher and his partner uh, Ruth come, uh, they arrive at the scene and the ending events of volume 333 occur where Ruth is killed and Thatcher uh, escapes an alternate attack, but also an alternate is made of him. So we then, uh, after this cut to a tape, from the Department of Temporal Phenomenon, which is a recurring government entity we see in the series, covering something called Operation Census, which is an attempt to collect data on just the different temporal phenomenon happening in Mandela County. Um, they record an unregistered vehicle going back and forth between Mandela and Yonder County almost a dozen times, but they don't ever capture footage of it returning and agent booker does a uh, recon on the house of one nicholas Berenger. he will be important later and notes several anomalies or as we know alternates it then cuts to an ad for a moving company called midwestern relocation services and we see jude's instructions to get to his safe house after escaping the alternate attack at his house jude holds up in the safe house which notably has a tv which at this point in time is illegal. TVs and mirrors have been ordered to be destroyed because alternates use them uh, to enter homes and influence children. And that's how they're kidnapping a lot of children. So, you know, Jude is responsible for the kidnapping of his child and the death of his ex-wife because he kept the TV. I like to think it's because he's an ain't shit dad that can't parent his own kid. Uh, so he just sat him in front of the TV and that's how my boy the intruder snatched that damn kid up. <laughs> After that we see an ad for a medication called Timerol that seems to be specifically targeted towards people who are susceptible to um, or have experienced alternate attacks. It's clearly an anxiety medication but I think it's got a little extra sauce in it. Um, so again, Day two without Lexapro. Would love something. <laughs> Would love something. So after this, it switches to the MVP of this entire episode. Let's get it out of the way. Y'all already knew every single time this man is involved in something. I'm gonna flip out. We have a beautifully animated Rankin and Bass style Bible cartoon done by none other than Mr. Thorne Baker. Please clap. I love him. Uh, Thorne Baker, if you did not know, is the main animator for the Mandela Catalog. He portrays Lieutenant Thatcher Davis in this. He is also the voice of the shepherd, and he is also uh, a musician, goes by Teenage Disaster. He made a delightful, it's not delightful, it's actually quite disturbing and upsetting, short horror film called The Sleepwalker Experiment that I made a video on. Go watch it. We'll go watch his video first, but then go watch my video covering it. Instead of the uh, repurposed Bible cartoons we've seen in the past, like in Overthrown, we finally have some OG content. Uh, and we see this shepherd discovering his lamb has passed away. Um, Gabriel appears to answer his prayers, and I, I love when Gabriel appears, y'all. I'm a sucker for an angel. I'm a sucker for religion. That's why I love this series. And uh, I'm so happy to see Gabriel again. <laughs> um, and Gabriel answers his prayers with a resurrected, realistic looking land. Everything else is very cartoony. Like I said, it, it makes me think of Rankin Bass, specifically like Nestor the Long Eared Donkey or like the little drummer boy. I grew up on that shit. I love Rankin and Bass stuff. Every Christmas, y'all. I love it. It's scary that this line looks real, right? Like, in universe, the shepherd is like, what the f is that? <laughs> then we cut back to Jude and he calls his relocation contact who tells 
him that, you know, a vehicle is gonna come pick him up. And we know based on the description of the make and model of the vehicle, that it is the vehicle that's been monitored by the uh, Operation Census, which then tells us there's a lot of people fleeing Mandela over to Yonder County. Jude calls the family doctor after this, telling him that they're moving and lying that Lynn and Adam are great and everything's perfect. And the doctor kind of makes him feel bad because the doctor's like, I'm proud of you. You're keeping your family safe. No, he ain't shit and he doesn't deserve anything. <laughs> I hate Jude Murray, I'm sorry. <laughs> Later that night, Jude heads downstairs and he sees what is likely, I think it's an alternate of him trying to take root. I don't think it's a, a friend of ours that we'll see later. I think there's a lot of alternate action happening in this creepy ass triangle house, um, but it looks like him. I literally thought it was his shadow at first, but I don't think it is. So then we cut back to our man, the shepherd, who uh, he's not vibing with this lamb. He does, he knows it is not good. He knows it's not right. Um, and a farmer named Jane, our resident baddie of the episode, AKA the only woman in the entire thing. Not a great track record for women in this series, I will say. Um, Miss Jane comes <laughs> asking the shepherd for grains and we get the funniest moment of this episode, maybe the entire series, I don't know. I think um, No Grain and Dave Lee could have a fist fight over who's funnier. You're a farmer with no grains. Why'd he say it like that? It's literally no bitches. Like, it's literally has the vibe of no bitches. You're a farmer without any grain? Oh my god. I love it. It's funny for no reason. Jane sees the lamb. And she's like, this thing is gorgeous, it's so beautiful. And he's like, bitch, it is not. And then she's like, I don't know anything about animals. So you can go to the house later. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm being very mean to Jane. So then uh, the shepherd's like, God, why did you do this to me? I don't want this freak ass lamb. And then he finds himself shackled in the desert where he screams out to Gabriel. How do I know you are holy? Which I think was a hard ass line. I think that's uh, that's up there with uh, who have I been praying to all this time? Marky Cliff classic. Um, Mr. Kister can write. Sometimes you can tell. You know what I mean? Like yes, yeah, sometimes the dialogue's corny, but then you get bangers like that, and my faith is restored a little bit. Then we go back to Mr. Jude, uh, and his contact calls him, and uh, Jude admits he's not leaving. He's gonna stay in the safe house. He pussied out. He says there was someone at the window and he didn't want to go outside. I wonder what that was. Um, and the contact essentially calls him a pussy ass bitch that failed his family and that he should just um, go to sleep forever <laughs> because we'll all be happier. And uh, we learn in this moment that Jude is taking terrible. So right after this, Jude gets a knock on his door and he sees uh, Lieutenant Davis it's not the real Lieutenant Davis, it's the alternate, um, who is there asking about uh, if they're complying with the TV and Mirror Destruction Act. And at this point, alternate Thatcher is like fresh. He's just been created. So all we see is like a, like a, like a shadow, but he's like wiggling. <laughs> he's like tweaking a little bit. Like I know he probably does not look right and Jude just doesn't care, I guess at this point, but I am assuming that like, he's not, all there because i love the thing i love so much about this series and internet horror on the whole i say this literally every episode of my channel i love when humanoid things can't quite get it right i just love it that's so scary so i do wish we would have seen a little bit more of alternate patcher but i get it that would have taken more time that would have taken more effects all that jazz right anyway alternate thatcher is literally just coming to fuck with you and make him feel like shit that's the entire point and he's like do i know you and do you remember me it's like yeah because you called 911 and then left just dipped you know despite this happening jude just keeps watching tv and uh the tv really rubs it in because it plays one of those old uh it's 10 pm do you know where your children are psas uh, you know what good make him feel bad <laughs> and then gabriel speaks to jude while he is sleeping saying it was supposed to be him and the alternates hack the tv with a um like broadcast 
interruption saying the same message and we see an alternate crawl out of the closet and back to the shepherd he's still shackled and in this desert environment and there are two uh dueling sand piles not to be confused with dueling banjos that begin speaking to him a male voice in favor of gabriel and then a female voice assuring him that gabriel can be stopped um, and this sequence is a callback to the very original Manzella catalog video, Overthrown, which ends with the quote, I am bound to chains on my ankles that grow heavier with every step. The infinite amount of sand will be my tomb, and my foolishness will be my legacy. If there is a god, please help me. So that's a nice tight bow wrapped around that. We know now that that was the shepherd. Um, the shepherd wakes up to find himself in Jane's house, and he's freaking out, telling her that he can feel Gabriel's presence, but she has no clue what he's talking about. She apparently had just prayed that they could be together, and she's happy that they're, like, the only two people left. And, uh, unfortunately, Gabriel appears behind her and then leaves behind a more real-looking body, similar to the lamb. So, I guess in this weird representation of the events that occurred because obviously it is like a cartoon the same way that like overthrown is depicting the events that happened as a cartoon this is the way that the alternates are like showing how scary it is that it's like real looking things um and that's the thing that i think a lot of people don't get because a lot of people goof on that original gabriel image they're like that's what you think is so scary no, it's not scary because that's what he actually looks like. It's scary because that's how a cartoon for children is depicting him. So he must look much more horrific than that. Um, okay? Yes, the image is a little silly, but imagine what he actually looks like. We have no clue what he actually looks like still to this day. Trevor then runs outside to find his glam who is just glitching. And uh, then Gabriel's all up behind him and we can only assume that Gabriel got to him. So after this, we're finishing out here. Jude wakes up to find the TV uh, showing the outside of the safe house. Hate that, that's so scary. Um, the David Lynch movie, Lost Highway, has a sequence like that. It makes me sick to my stomach. <laughs> uh, and he looks out the window and he sees Adam's crib. So these alternates are just shoving it in his face that he is the most ancient dad ever. And he goes downstairs and sees N, the alternate of Nicholas Berenger, creeping around outside with absolutely impeccable, beautiful animation and puppet work from the one and only Draxum, an artist who I love, 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 commissioned two things from her. She's just incredible. So happy to see her involved in this. Um, and N pursues Jude back to his room where Jude kind of hides in the closet, essentially is like, go ahead and kill me, I don't give a fuck. Um, and he ends up seeing a vision of himself being uh, pulled up on a rope, if you know what I mean. And uh, then I assume N is delivering information that is not to be desired. And uh, Jude's Timberwolf pills are then on the ground and we can assume that he has, um, gone to sleep for a long time if you catch my drift and it ends there wow a lot happened in only half an hour let's get on to a little bit of analysis before i tell you my own personal thoughts this is just my analysis do i think some things that i'm saying here are like definitively right yeah are other things just theories of mine sure and again, I haven't listened to anyone else's theories. I can finally go watch all that stuff. Uh, I'm free, you know? Uh, but this is all just my thoughts and opinions. And if you are, have never watched my channel before, I'm very uh, Catholic-pilled. I'm not religious, but I'm very into religion, if you can't tell by all of this. And my angel tattoos and St. Sebastian tattoos and, you know... I, this is a pulpit. There's, I have a facsimile here, and uh, this is is a pew, and I'm recording this in a room I call the chapel. I'm giving myself religious trauma. It's self-inflicted. But anyway, so I am absolutely analyzing this with um, the knowledge that I have of Bible history and Bible storytelling. And yes, obviously that is intentional in this series. It is a religious-based series. Anyway, so 
Let's just start off with Jude. He sucks. He's a horrible dad. I really don't feel bad for him for even one second. He lack, completely lacks normal remorse for his family unless he is directly reminded uh, of what he did by either like the doctor, his contact, or the alternates. Like he was quick to flee the scene, not do anything to help his wife. Um, he couldn't deal with Adam's behavioral issues from the start, and I think that's why he divorced his wife and just left the family. At the beginning of three, she's calling, pleading with him for help. So. He just doesn't care. He's a shitty dad. I don't like him. This carelessness led to Adam's kidnapping, which is really a catalyst for a chunk of this series. Adam, you know, for a long time was the main character of this series. I think that's, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen with Adam in the future now because in some of the smaller episodes between four and five, you've seen that he, you know, he knows he's an alternate, the intruder let him know that, hey, you're not real, you're an alternate. Um, and he's currently, you know, hanging out with Thatcher Davis who's trying to help him. So maybe he can be the first good alternate. I don't know. I don't have, I don't have, I don't have a lot of hope for Adam. Um, and it's all because of this shitty dad. So, you know, like I was just talking about the Bible and Christianity and this series is no stranger to really punch you in the face over biblical connections. And this entry is no exception. Um, in the past we've had, you know, Adam, it's Adam and Eve, uh, Jonah is like Jonah and, and the whale. <laughs> like they're very Eve, Evelyn, very over. <laughs> it's, it's text, not subtext. Um, and in this case, we are talking about good old Judas, who is one of my favorite biblical characters. I love Judas. And I'll get into that in a second. But um, in this case, we have two representations of Judas. We have Jude Murray, very obvious, his name is literally Judas Murray. <laughs> Imagine naming your child Judas. <laughs> Imagine. Um, and then the shepherd also, I believe, is the stand-in for Judas. Now, Judas, like I just said, is one of my all-time favorite biblical characters. As someone who is not religious, mind you, this is just me viewing it from a storytelling perspective, um, because he can be interpreted in so many different ways. And he can be interpreted as just a overt, complete villain with no remorse, not at all guilty for what he did. Or he can be viewed as a very human, flawed, remorseful man who just loves his friend. Um, and if you're not familiar, Judas is Jesus's closest disciple who ends up betraying him and turning him into the Romans, which leads to Ju uh, Jesus's crucifixion. I maintain that Judas had to do that. He was preordained by God to betray him or Jesus would not have been able to be crucified um, and, you know, die on the cross to save all of humanity. Um, I don't necessarily believe, I don't know what I believe. I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a Christian. I would call myself agnostic and very into the history of Christianity. But with that narrative, right, Judas, without Judas, there is no resurrected Jesus, right? So I don't think he's a bad guy. I think he was dealt a shit hand in the story. And that's why I'm so compelled by him as a character. And my two favorite film depictions of Judas portray him in this more human, um, emotional man who, you know, loves his friend. And that would be Harvey Keitel's performance in The Last Temptation of Christ, um, which that's my favorite movie of all time. I have a Last Temptation of Christ tattoo. <laughs> um, where he, uh, He's very angry at Jesus and tries to get him to stop, you know, going after all this crazy Messiah business. Um, but there is this incredible scene where he knows what he has to do and Jesus confronts him about it and he weeps and begs not to have to do it because he loves him so much. Uh, and Jesus, you know, tells him like, if you love me, you have to do this. And that book and film, I view the relationship between Jesus and Judas as very, like, overtly romantic. I'll say it. Um, I believe they're in love with each other. At minimum, Judas is in love with Jesus, fully. Uh, and then, which is a fascinating, fascinating way to, to view that relationship and those characters, right? Um, sorry if I'm being blasphemous. It's, I'm, t 
I'm a bit, I'm wearing black lipstick. Of course I'm saying that Jesus and Judas kissed each other. What do you want from me? <laughs> and then my other one that I love is um, Carl Anderson's performance in Jesus Christ Superstar, which Jesus Christ Superstar is a musical by Andrew Lloyd Webber. And it's really from the perspective of Judas. And um, it opens up with Judas essentially singing this song called Heaven on Our Mind, or Heaven, yeah, Heaven on Their Mind, uh, that's explaining that this is gonna end badly. He wishes that Jesus would just stop. He should just be a man. Um, and I, <laughs> the line, talk about hard lines, he says, your followers are blind, too much heaven on their mind. And it's just the thought of, you're not thinking of the consequences of what will happen here on earth. You are blinded by this potential for heaven that at this point, Judas isn't even sure that Jesus will reach. He is just so concerned about his mortal friend. And wouldn't you be? You know, you can believe and believe in someone, but you don't wanna lose your friend, right? Your best friend in the whole world. And that may be selfish, but is it not human to be selfish? Anyway, sorry, I'm freaking out about Judas too much. I love Judas. I also love the Lady Gaga song Judas and Norman Reedus's portrayal of biker Judas in maybe the best music video ever made. It's so good. I love that song. I would play it right now, but I would be copyright struck. And I want this video monetized, god damn it. I think Alex Kister did a very good job in this showing these two sides of Judas. Jude Murray is the evil, remorseless, ain't shit Judas that I think a lot of people reduce Judas to. And the shepherd is the human, remorseful, kind of tragic. Judas. You know, Jude has betrayed those closest to him, and in this case, his Christ figure is Adam, his son. Um, because, you know, Adam is killed and resurrected as the alternate Adam. Obviously, Adam's connections to the biblical figure of Adam are obvious. It's very blatantly laid out in four, especially with his girlfriend being named Evelyn. Um, and it starts out with the Adam and Eve um, segment, which I love that segment for. Um, I've always viewed Adam as one of the potential Christ figures for the series because he is killed as a child and then resurrected. And I think the other Christ figure could be Thatcher because he survives the alternate attack. And like you could argue the red, like the alternate Thatcher is the resurrected Thatcher. It's weird. There's a, <laughs> I will get into my feelings and questions about Christ in this series in a second because I, I thought about it for too long and it made me spiral and maybe it's just because I'm not on my vacation. But uh, let me talk about the shepherd for a second. The shepherd portrays the version of Judas I was talking about that we see in like Last Temptation of Christ and Jesus Christ Superstar. He's, he's flawed, he's human, but he cares deeply uh, for those around him, which in his case is his animals. Uh, he has no one else, right, except Jane, but he doesn't really seem to know her. And his Christ figure is the lamb, which is, you know, not a reach at all because the lamb is literally, the sacrificial lamb is literally a representation for Jesus in art and, you know, all over the place. I have a, like, you can't see it right now because I'm wearing clothes, but I have a, I have a sacrificial lamb tattoo right here because I love my religious imagery. <laughs> like I said, um, you know, my two favorite Judas depictions, Harvey Keitel and Carl Anderson, they're Judases, um, they're in love with Jesus, whether um, romantically or platonically, and um, they don't want to lose the human part of him, so they kind of denounce his divinity. And in this case, our shepherd's lamb is not divine, it's damned, but he knows. Like, he knows something is not right with this lamb that Gabriel presents him, right? This is where I want to discuss like how Jesus fits into this universe. And it made me crazy a little bit. Because there are churches that exist in the Mandela catalog universe, we know it. Mark goes to a church, he grew up Christian. Um, we have, you know, Dave Lee thinks O'Brien works at a church. And we know that the churches are run by alternates because Gabriel's behind everything, right? So there must be a Christ figure because Christianity still exists. <laughs> so what happened? Clearly, he's an alternate, right? But what, what does alternate Jesus 
what is alternate Jesus? I assume he has no control over anything because it's Gabriel. Does he look like a person? Like, was Gabriel able to perfect him as, like, the perfect alternate, the way that Adam is? Like, is Adam the Antichrist? Does he look weird? What does a crucifix look like? In this? Have we ever seen a crucifix? See, I feel like I'm tweaking. <laughs> Does Jesus have any say over anything? Like, is he like a right-hand man the way that the intruder is? Or is he just a puppet? I have lots of questions. I have no answers. I just wanted to present that. That's not analysis. That's just me. Like, I want to know what you- what do you think of Jesus? <laughs> what a sentence that it could only come out of my mouth. <laughs> oh, y'all, I'm sweating. I'm, I'm stepping away from the Judas stuff for now, y'all, because if I keep talking, I'm gonna lose it. We have the introduction of Timoral here. So I I think Timoral's bad. I think real-life antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication is great if you need it. Don't ever take this talk of me and Timoral as me thinking that, that I denounce those things. Like I said, I take Lexapro. I used to take Zoloft. I didn't like Zoloft. I love Lexapro. So you find your thing if you need it. But Timoral, I think, is bad. <laughs> Latin word, I found this in a comment. The Latin word Timor means fear. Uh, so I think it's not helpful. I think that it's an alternate name drug that makes people more susceptible to alternate coercion. And I think we have evidence of this because Jude was taking it. So Jude was just setting himself up to just be ripe for an alternate attack. Um, and maybe that's what Gabriel means by, you know, it, it should have been you. That they were priming him to be the one taken, not Adam, but because he let Adam hang out by the TV, the intruder was able to grab Adam and do all that. Uh, which, yeah, I'll say it. I'll go on record. The intruder is a better dad than Jude Murray. I don't think Jude Murray was cradling him in his arms, his sweet baby boy. Okay? As the girl with the intruder tattoo. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a plant. I'm an alternate. I think Timoral, I think that the alternates are drugging people essentially, which is so funny. The, the thought of like, like the intruder or like N as like a pharmaceutical rep showing up to a doctor's office, just this like freak person that doesn't look quite like a person just like shaking like a damn um, man in black being like, buy these pills. Please buy these pills. Buy my pills. Um, and you know the doctor was like, is it gonna make me money? <laughs> sure, I'll do it. And then the last thing to look at here is um, N or Nicholas Berenger. N is one of the oldest alternates we have had in this series. He makes an appearance in Mandela Catalog Volume 1. He's one of the first actual spooky alternates we see. So I love that he's here and I love that he's uh, he's gotten a makeover. Like most of our favorite characters. He's looking fresh and fit, thanks to Draxon, who again, I cannot sing the praises of enough. I love her, she is so talented. I don't have a lot on N right now. I know that um, Alex has said that we're gonna learn more about him in the future. So, I mean, really put a pin in it for now. But I do think he's, he's important. I don't know if he's, you know, a higher level alternate, the way that the intruder is, or if he is just kind of conveniently, you know, the alternate that attacked the Murrays. I think the Midwestern Relocation Services, um, which obviously I think is a front for this relocation post-alternate attack thing, uh, I think they could be in cahoots with the alternates and that's because the Operation Census folks were tracking that car that we know was the car that was gonna come pick up Jude. Around the same time they were tracking um, Nicholas Berenger as a suspect of interest. So I think all those other alternates that the agent described um, could be people working for Midwestern Relocation Services and they could just be, you know, relocating them to the alternates. <laughs> and I think that could be why the contact was just so uh, rude and belittling to Jude when he said he wasn't coming because he's just in cahoots with alternates. That's just a, like a theory. I'm not like, that's me throwing shit at the wall and hoping it sticks. But that's what I got. That's my analysis for this one. And now, while well, I take a deep breath after screaming about Judas for 20 minutes, I'll let you know what I think of this one. There was a lot, this is like the longest 
in between a Mendel catalog entry. One could even argue that perhaps the original uh, run came out too quickly, like there wasn't enough time to let him cook. We've seen that when you wait, sometimes you get some damn gold, like with Walton Files 4. Um, so I think there was a lot of hype for Volume 5, and I don't know what, like when I first, well, I stayed up, I watched the premiere, right? And I don't know, I, it just didn't hit me the way that like Volume 4 had hit me. But again, I've watched it four times now and it has grown on me. I think it's a lot subtler than the previous entries and I don't think that's a bad thing because sometimes the Mandela Kettle can be a little much. I, um, I know four is a very controversial entry into the series, but I love it. It's one of my favorites. I would say three and four are my favorite. Three I think is objectively the best. It really hits just the sweet spot. Four is that shit and all over the place, but I think it has some of the best moments in the entire series. Like, I love the, like, I am conversations between Adam and Sarah and all the stuff of Adam making the memorial thing for Jonah and the intruder. I mean, the intruder sequence is without a doubt to me the best thing in the entire series. And yes, that's because I love the intruder and I love Thorne Baker's animation. So when you smush those things together, I'm a happy camper. So maybe that's not your favorite thing, but it's my favorite thing. But there's a lot of weird shit in four. You know, a lot of people did not like the visual style of the live action. And yeah, it's weird. I, it's grown on me. There's goofy elements. Dave Lee is a goofy character and it is a lot to put one of your most emotional moments on a character that is a teenager wearing a fake mustache and a voice pitch down. So I get it. I get why people are not happy about that. This one is a lot tighter. It's a lot uh, more serious. I would say the only funny thing in the entire thing is like the Tim Roll ad is kind of funny in a way that like you know, like the WNUF fake ads are, but it's an ad, so that it doesn't really take you out of it. And then no grain, no bitches, no grain is funny, but like, it doesn't take you out of it. It's just genuinely funny. <laughs> In moments, it feels more just like a short film than analog horror. And that I think was my initial, I guess, thing I didn't like about it. Um, I, I don't think that the, the film segments, like the live action segments are bad at all in this but it, it feels almost a little flat. Like I wish that almost the weird, like contrasty layered look of four was present a little bit more in this. And I know a lot of people criticize that, so I get why he switched it. But in general, I wish there was more alternates. Um, I love Draxum, I love N in this. I think she did an incredible job with him. So I wish he was in there a little bit more but I will say delaying him to the last bit made that sequence very impactful. And obviously the animation is impeccable per usual. The sequence with the shepherd is great. It's the best Bible short sequence in, you know, the entire series uh, because it's original and it's, it's exactly how, you know, they wanted it to be because it was made for it. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, again, I can't sing his praises enough. He's incredibly talented. I think his vocal performance as a shepherd was great. In general, I think the acting in this is the best it's probably ever been. Um, the actor that played Jude, let me get his name because I don't have his name off the top of my head. Michael Vale, um, he did a good job. You know, he actually looked his age, which is a first <laughs> for this series. Per usual, Thorne's great at voice acting. Um, I think Jamie Lee, who was the farmer, she did great. Dr. Williamson was Deshaun Ricks, did great. Um, Alex was the Tim Roll actor, that was fun. And uh, so that's great, because I think that's something that's been shaky with this series in the past, is the acting. I think acting in general is getting a lot better in analog horror. Like, woo, that's been great, I really appreciate that. And one thing that I, did not like about four that was fixed in this. I didn't like that um, Gabriel had voice. I, I don't, I love the text to speech. I think the text to speech is perfect because it makes him this like dumb anomaly that is so like unfathomable that he can't even speak normally because he is the source, he is the original alternate. So he like, I feel like he doesn't even really try fully 
to be human now that he's convinced everyone. So I love the text of speech voice. So I was glad to see that come back. Visuals, it's it's all like Thorn and Draxon are the MVPs of this. Uh, they just are. They have elevated the series. You know, Thorn really elevated the series back at Volume Three, and Draxon continues to add to that with this. I hope that we get more of these puppets and 2D animation from her because it just makes it so unique and stylish. Um, that's the thing I love about Thorne's stuff too, is he has a style, he has an aesthetic that um, makes the series unique and she's adding to that in her own way and I love really it. Those things are really exciting to me, but I think I just expected more, I guess, but when I rewatched it four times, I realized it ties so many loose ends together that it's almost like we needed this in order for the series to continue. Um, you know, it, it completes the entire Murray family's arc from the 90s, right? We know what happened to the entire family. It goes back to the original Shepard quote from Overthrown, completes that arc shows us more about what Gabriel was doing immediately after he talked to Mary in Overthrown. Um, and just that, you know, gave us more of, of N, who clearly is going to be a very important figure going forward. So I think this was very necessary. I think this was a very kind of matured version of the Mandela catalog. I would like to see a little bit more, I guess, of the stuff like the temporal phenomenon section that just feels a little more analog horror -y. but you know this is a case where this is one of the biggest series in the genre and we can't expect it to continue to stay the same and it really hasn't it's evolved and changed um for better or worse every episode and i think for better or worse is literally up to an individual's perception like I said, I love Thor. It's always going to be one of my favorites because there's so much to like about it for me as someone who loves The Intruder, loves Thatcher Davis, loves the sillier aspects of this series. Of course, I'm gonna like Thor, but for people that like when it's more serious and um, like film quality, you probably love Volume 5. So, you know, it's gonna keep changing and a lot of these series do and we gotta let it happen <laughs> because they take time to make and these creators often you know don't expect it to blow up the way it does and you know as time goes on you evolve your story uh so we can't expect it to stay exactly the same i mean i'd be hard pressed to find an analog horror series that hasn't changed aesthetically you know i mean maybe local 58 but no that's not true either because there's an entire animated short for children in that one. This, this series is consistent in its story, maybe not the medium in which the story is told, but I think that's okay. And one thing that I really liked when I rewatched this one is at first I thought when I watched it the night it premiered, it felt very like jarringly segmented to me, but then I realized it's being presented like you're flipping through channels on a TV, which I think is genius because you know, the TV is the crux of this whole issue. If Jude would have actually raised his kid and kept him away from the TV, none of this would have happened. Uh, so I loved that, you know. The Timoral ad and the, the Midwestern relocation services felt like ads. And, you know, the tape from the um, Department of Temporal Phenomenon felt like it was like leaked or a tape you weren't supposed to have. Um, and then, you know, our main events are you know, watching Jude through the TV almost the way that we see, you know, the outside of the the safe house on the TV and then the Bible short. Those are like the main movies we're watching on the TV, if that makes sense. So I think that was a really interesting way to go about framing this, actually, especially when we're centering on Jude Murray, who couldn't give up his damn TV, right? This was a long time coming. There's a whole, there's a little extra <laughs> video that um was put out from Mandela catalog that i was going to talk about but honestly i have too many thoughts about it it's not long but i can't i can't keep yapping so i'm gonna make an entire video just about that which is ridiculous because it's like a 30 second TikTok. you know i'll find a way to make a 15 minute video about that but thank you so much for watching let me know what you thought of volume five what's your favorite entry into the Mandela catalog um 
And, uh, who's your favorite Bible character? <laughs> if there are any series you want me to cover, I know I've covered two um, of the big, big biggies back to back because I did the back rooms last week and then obviously I'm doing the Mandela catalog right now. So I always love when you all suggest smaller series to me. Um, there's definitely going to be some like update videos in the future. McKinney Family Home videos has been going, going, going. And I will say by the time this comes out, the pre-order will be live actually for the McKinney Family Home videos um, through retro release video, which is so exciting. And I did the cover art for it. Yay! So if you want to support the McKinney Family Home videos, retro release video, and Miss Glitch Witch herself, please pre-order that. Um, I can't sing the praises of, of McKinney enough. I've been loving the releases as they've been coming out. So for um, season two, focusing more on Diana McKinney. Oof, that diva. So um, I will definitely make a McKinney um, season two video in the future. Joaquin Bonk, one of my other favorite smaller creators, has been making a lot of like one-off shorts that I would like to cover in the future. But please, you know, suggest smaller series to me. I have a few in my back pocket that I will definitely cover in the future, but I love hearing from y'all because, uh, you know, you find things I never would find on my own. I do want to say too, Retro Release, they um, are big supporters of analog horror, so please support them in general. Um, I'm, I've never spoken <laughs> to them. Don't think that they're asking me to plug this. I work directly with Nick, the creator of McKinney Family Home Videos as far as like, the cover and stuff goes, so Retro Release probably doesn't even know who I am. <laughs> but I, I've pre-ordered, I pre-ordered the Mandela catalog from them and um, the, uh, um, what was the other one? They did the Mandela catalog, they did Dreams of an Insomniac, they did Vita Carnis, They've done um, Harmony and Horror and they did Alan Tutorials was the other one I just ordered because I love Alan Tutorials. So I just love to see someone releasing analog horror and working directly with analog horror creators um, to get physical releases because I think physical release is an amazing thing, especially when our, you know, lovely creators are being supported by it. So please support them. I would like to thank my YouTube members. The, the uh, lovely creepypasta OCs are up on the screen, and then in survival horror emo, we have Erob, Odini, and so called punk, and then in analog horror scary face, which for this episode that would have been N, uh, we have Kira Coffer. So thank you so much. If you would like to support me in that way, there's a little join button next to the subscribe button. Um, but just liking, subscribing, commenting, sharing, all that, that means the world. So um, thank you so much for watching. You know, you can keep your TV because we live in a world where TVs are allowed. But uh, if you see someone that looks like you, run away and hide, right? Bye. You're a farmer with no grains.